the uh, the IOCC. Um, why would I go to twelve? Why is it here? The uh, so how many people here right now uh, know what IOCC is about? And how many people? Um, It is not going forward. There we go. Anyway, so the you know, IOCC is was founded in 1992. Um, it serves um, 60 nations across the world. Uh, it basically has some, it's donated $742 million to various countries around the world. And this small thing, you can see that the far one in the, on the left there, upper left, um, that's basically fire response for Greece. And then you see the next to it, moving to the right was the IOCC Thanksgiving, Sunday before Thanksgiving. And they accept cars as well. And they, you can actually get uh, stories and pamphlets for Sunday schools as well from IOCC. The one that I worked on is in that lower left-hand corner. The guy out front there is Dan Hepp, and I worked with him in a couple locations. Um, they are part of the World Council of Churches and various relief organizations. Um, and they're basically right now in Ukraine doing, doing work there, putting kids together and passing out a whole lot of information or equipment. The uh, right now in Ukraine, right now they're passing out not only baby food and bottles and, and cocks and mattresses and essential toiletries and um, to all the people coming in from Ukraine. Uh, they moved into uh, Romania and Moldova the week after. Um, the attack started and they went in through the churches. They went in through Poland, but I, I haven't heard anything going on in Poland, but I know they're in, they went through the Romanian Orthodox Church and the Moldovan uh, Orthodox Church as well. Right now they're looking for uh, generators, looking for batteries, looking to basically help with communications uh, look to local entities there. Since 1992, they've provided more than $742 million of humanitarian relief. Um, again, this was initially started to be an international organization. The US program only started in 2001 as a result of September 11th. And um, it was at that time, basically they started that's part of it. They're currently, like I said earlier, in 60 nations around the world. And they're, they provide benefits regardless of religion, um, regardless of, you know, they just basically go on purely on need. In the US program that I was part of, um, there was a guy, Dan Hoft, and I volunteered with him uh, a couple places. He works all around the USA. He's one of their actual employees. Uh, he's worked for them for 14 years and worked about 10 different disasters around the country. This was uh, what we were doing in Louisiana. Uh, in St. Charles Parish, they suffered through 150 mile an hour winds for about three hours. Um, at that time, you have to realize that the damage done to some of the houses there uh, work was extensive. And we went in there and we start, we had to go in there and literally tear down the drywall, tear down the insulation, uh, do all that work to get it ready to have it redone. 
a lot of the insurance that comes through does not pay to have that type of demolition work done. They'll pay to have it rebuilt if you got good insurance, but they won't pay to have that stuff torn down. Uh, to have this work done is somewhere between ten dollars to $15,000 worth of effort uh, that we were providing for free uh, to several homeowners. And it was, uh, it was quite um, moving to have some of the homeowners come out and basically they would see all of their belongings being taken out to the curb. So you figure these people were in such despair. And this is why the program now is divided into the US program has the frontliners as well as the people down on the ground um, who do the work like, like Dan here. The frontliners typically go in and take care of the uh, emotional needs of the people. They're the priests, they're psychologists, they're mental health officials that go in. It's not that they don't do work because we had some priests out there, they rolled their sleeves and they do work like everyone else. Um, but also the, the ones on the ground, part of the uh, volunteer teams, they would have to also be very, very cognizant of the homeowners. And you gotta basically go through a lot of their belongings, making sure that everything that they wanna have thrown away is thrown away. And that if they change their mind, you are able to you know, connect with them and make sure that they have everything saved that they can save. The, uh, when a house is pretty much done, we have it taken down to the individual joists and we basically tear it all the way down. It is amazing to have people thank you when you get to this level, okay? Because you've taken out all the furniture that they've ever owned. You've taken down the walls. You've taken out the carpeting. You've taken everything out, the insulation, at the roof all the way down. And the amazing thing is when you get to this level, they're actually thanking you. Uh, it's pretty crazy to have everything that you ever owned on the curb and them to work, them to be coming back and thanking you. Yes. So how long were you there? How long were you? Two, uh, I've done about a month worth of work with IOCC. I was down in Louisiana for two weeks. <clears throat> now, you know, one of the interesting things that, that we were doing down there, we were actually working with a, um, a Jewish organization. Uh, IOCC has this ability to network. Uh, you know, what they were doing in Romania and Poland and Moldova within the week, the way they were able to move in, their idea is to actually go in, put seed money down, or, you know, maybe up to a million dollars I'm talking about in uh, Ukraine. But what they want to do, they want to get to a point where they're, they are sustainable. And they're doing that in uh, Louisiana. But they put down the seed money, they show other organizations, such as the Red Cross, such as uh, not necessarily FEMA, FEMA is different, but some of the other uh, United Way, for example, which was down in Louisiana. Uh, they show them that, hey, we're here to do the job. You give us a little bit of money and we can continue and sustain it. Right now in Louisiana, uh, United Way is providing housing for all volunteers. So we've got a place we can cook, we can go a place we can shower, we can go, we have a place where we can go and sleep, which is very important. So the IOCC doesn't have to pay for the accommodations. The United Way is picking that up because they see the work that we're doing. Tomorrow, say a prayer for Dan. He's meeting with the United Way officials to see if we can extend the uh, effort in Louisiana to go toward building. Because you know, there's not only the uh, you know the recovery, there's also the repair and the rebuilding that IOCC does. So they they don't only do this; they'll basically they'll we'll go in there, we'll do the drywall, we'll do a lot of the stuff, we'll do the, put floors back in, get it as far as we can go before the homeowner takes over with their insurance. A lot of them don't have insurance. These are every person we worked with or every homeowner. We worked for down there was effectively either a uh, middle class or a poor black family. And um, I'll just be frank with you, I did not darken the threshold of one person other than a black family. 
down there. And they were so grateful uh, to have us in there. Um, let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Yeah, working with Nakama, apparently we're, we've been down there the whole time with them. They are a Jewish relief organization. And just to tell you, you know, it's a story. If we were down there, our tires were being popped all the time because on the trucks that we, we had. Every, you know, three times while we were down there, we were having to go to tire shops and get our tires fixed because twice with roofing nails and one time with uh, this woman, Emily, who was dry, driving a Nakama truck, she picked up a piece of debris in her tire. The whole truck started bouncing around. She was at another location and she called for help. Okay. So I jump in the truck. I'm driving. I've got Father uh, Vasile, he's a Romanian guy, next to me. And we, we go out to help Emily in her truck. Now, on the side of the Nakama truck, they have like, you know, Jewish um, disaster relief. Let me see what I've got if I got it right. Jewish response to disasters. Okay. And they got a big Nakama thing on there. Can't miss them in blue letters. So, we get out and she's at a gas station and we, we get out and there's a guy pumping gas right there. And we pull up and father gets out. And the guy says, you know, it's like, is there a punchline here? You know, I mean, you know, the, you know, the, the, it, it's gotta be a joke because the Christians are just, you know, stopping to help, you know, the, this Jewish uh, driver. And, you know, father, I forget exactly what he said, but he says, this is no joke. He said something like, we go where God sends us. And it was like, the guy just started laughing. But I think he got a good chuckle out of it. But it was a, it, we got her back on the road again. Um, that was too far. Why are you? Hmm. Yeah. Here's uh, Nooli and Chef. The, these guys were kind of very, very neat. They live in Minneapolis. They, um, they actually run food trucks. They had a restaurant in Minneapolis called the uh, Tin Fish. And they work up there during the uh, summer. And then they basically volunteer for IOCC all winter because a lot of the places they have to go is, is warmer. Um, they are, um, they've only been volunteering for five years. Uh, but I got to tell you, they are so delightful couple to work with. Uh, you know, these guys basically uh, helped cement my uh, desire to, to continue, uh, you know, with IOCC. Uh, they're really highly religious Orthodox people, always saying prayers, always, you know, out there. And they're extremely talented. And the fact that they can really cook helps tremendously. <laughs> Yeah, this was the rebuilding that we did down in Daytona. Uh, you've got, yeah, this was uh, Darlene's house and she she's a caregiver. And we went down there and in one week, we ended up giving her a new kitchen that you can see in the lower left. Uh, we tore off her old roof, replaced a lot of, uh, I don't know, I forget how many, uh, pieces of uh, plywood we replaced on a roof, but it was more than that contractor had. He had to go back and get more uh, roof, uh, plywood material. And then we had the inspector come in that slowed us down tremendously. And he came in finally, and we finished the roof on the house and got her not only a new kitchen, but we were supposed to use her old stove. And we, um, we just took a donation up between the 10 of us that were working on the house and we collected $350. And this guy, Jake, he had drove down to uh, Daytona. And uh, we went out one morning early, uh, earlier than I would have wanted. Uh, but uh, we went out to Lowe's because Jake didn't want to go alone. And I happened to be up uh, briefly, going back to bed. And, and he says, Mike, I'm going to Lowe's. And I said, OK. And I kind of, and he kind of just looked in there, like, you know, and I said, do you want me to go with you? And he says, yes. And I go, oh, <laughs> I was going to go back to bed. 
But anyway, we went to Lowe's, we had 350 bucks. And when we got there, Jake had to move some stuff out of his uh, outback, you know, to make room for whatever stove we ended up getting. And so I told him, I said, tell you what, measure the height of your, uh, from the bed, see how big it is. And I'm going to run in. He had to find his tape measure and move some stuff. I found the manager and I said, I, and I told him I was wearing, I was wearing the IOCC shirt and I explained to him, we got a woman. And it just went through, we re redoing our home. We're not going to use our old stove. I need a stove that's really your least expensive, but it's right. And so we went down, I was walking down like, you know, $1,200 stoves. I was like, oh, you know, kept on walking down. And finally we get to the back of the store, we hang a left and there's some other stoves that were there for like damage and return. I'm going down, going down, going down. No, no, $500, no. Keep on going down. Finally at the end, there's her exact stove, but instead of a four burner, it's a five burner. And it looks like it's white, it's perfect. It's like it was meant for her house. $349. <laughs> I will tell you, Jake picked up the, uh, the uh, taxes, but that, that was great. Anyway, she, uh, she was very happy with that. This thing jumps around. Okay, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a home front parish, because this is kind of important. Um, home front Home front parishes basically prepare before disasters. Um, you know, it's possibly the most important thing I could cover this evening because um, it helps not only us personally in case of a disaster, um, but it can also help our neighbors. Um, the idea is to make a personal preparedness plan, okay? And the goal of the, the goal of this plan is basically to prepare you for the things that you will need. And basically to volunteer, you must be able to leave your house in short notice and go help other people. Uh, you know, the Bible says you cannot serve two masters. Well, if your house, if you're not, if your house is not, if you're not able to leave your family because you need to provide for them, you cannot then go out and help somebody else. So if you prepare yourself to be ready uh, for things like, food, water, power, communications, first aid, and lighting, you'd be more apt to be able to help. Now that's one part. The second part is um, IOCC offers training programs and I could pull up a, a wonderful PDF about how a church can actually prepare for, uh, for disasters. And the idea is, the idea is effectively to prepare a church to, to effectively house IOCC members that would come in. And this, this is a big, this, this is actually a big piece of responsibility for a church, okay? Would you be willing to take a classroom and put four, four people in one room and five or six people in another room? Well, you got a kitchen, you got bathrooms, there's no shower, okay? There's no laundry, okay? Because I'll tell you right now, people get dirty. They need to shower, they need to wash their clothes. IOCC literally bring a trailer, put it in the parking lot and help and have a contractor come in and help hook it up for you. It's that type of thing that they do, okay? Now they claim they have 75 parishes around the country, okay, that they can do this with. When I was down in Daytona, I was staying in a uh, Methodist church and it's kind of interesting that Methodist church could easily, they had a, a easily house 30, 40 people. Okay, in the dormitories, they had a dormitories there with kitchen and living room area there. We don't have that kind of thing. The Methodists are really, really into service oriented type of, you know, that's what they do. They don't have beautiful iconostas, but they do know how to serve. And when I was down in uh, Key West, we stayed at a Presbyterian church, which was a little unusual overall, I'm not gonna get into that, but, I've never stayed in an Orthodox church. I did hear that they stayed in an Orthodox church in um, Houston, if I'm not mistaken. Now, when we were down in you know, Louisiana, we stayed at the a community college that had just been damaged. They put the roof on it and we were able to go into it and stay there. Now, they have 75 churches getting back to that around the country. 
but there are 1800 Orthodox churches in the country. Okay, I don't know if that includes Canada or not. I'm not sure. But it's like, it just makes you think, we, we could do more. We could do more. This is a beautiful church. We got tremendous resources here. I'm not saying we would need it. I would hope we never would. However, you know, you have to realize that no matter where we stay, the group is going to drive close to an hour to go to the work sites. So it's not like, oh, it's going to be right next door. We might have to go to the eastern shore, someplace like that, and need an Orthodox church that we can stay at. It's that type of uh, thing. It's worth thinking about as a parish. Uh, I thought I'd drop that little bomb <laughs> to think about. And probably, and this is my last slide here. And this is, I'm also a volunteer with Maryland Responds, uh, their medical reserve corps. And what this is, this is basically one of their website front pages <laughs> that goes through five modules of training that they go through. And um, I, I have done this and I've done other training as well. But this, is, this was actually very, very good. Going from left to right, from one to five, uh, you know, the, number one, the course serves as an introduction uh, to orientation of the training. It describes its purpose and technical instructions for completing the course, and it's followed by a pre-test. Uh, number two, basically, is a discussion of the history and purpose of Maryland Responds and goes into a little bit of, you know, what it actually does. Three, basically, describes a purpose and lists the basic components of the uh, NIMS or the National Incident Management System, which is an overall management system used for disasters in this country. Number four describes the incident command system, which is more down on the ground. Uh, the ICS in, <clears throat> and the concept of chain of command during an emergency event it discusses the advantages of using shared common communications like all the acronyms used and things like that can actually cause a breakdown in some of the uh, ability to provide good emergency uh, relief. And number five describes the policies and procedures for all the phases of disaster relief deployment, discusses the importance of having a personal preparedness plan. It goes and explains a job action sheet and assists in identifying not only your job in a relief but also the supervisor, your responsibilities before, during, and after. Afterwards, you have to make sure that you're handing off to the next, next people that come in after you um, at the end of your shift. So at the end, you have to make sure the people coming in know what you've done, know what they're expected to do, know who you've been contacting or getting help from, and how long it took you to do some of the things. And uh, and also goes through some of the roles that other volunteers have, so that if you know you need some help, you can go to another volunteer and request help. And that's about all I've got. Uh, I did expect to actually probably work a little bit longer on some of the or give you more information, but I'll just let open up for questions if you have any at all. Yes. So, um, if someone wanted to volunteer, is there a website? So oh, yeah. They, they are, they are, um, that, 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 those are good questions. You go to the IOCC uh, website and you will see uh, on the banner, they changed it. Now you see a volunteer. Okay. And you can go to uh, basically the US program under that. And it'll ask you a bunch of information. You know, basically you gotta fill out information there about yourself. There are, um, there, there are several medical forms you literally need to fill out. You have to fill out, um, and I'm gonna say there's at least five different forms that you end up having to sign uh, to, get, to go out in the field. Now, what qualifications do you need? If you can hold a paintbrush, you're probably qualified. If you can hold a hammer, chances are you're qualified. 
Uh, it's, it's that type of thing. Uh, they do have a, a lot of highly skilled people that go out in the field. You'll never be out there without at least one or two leads uh, and to give you uh, information about what to do. Um, they supply all the materials. You, don't, you know, if you want to bring in uh, boots and things like that and gloves, sure, but they do have gloves for you. If you want your own, bring them. Um, they are, as far as time, you have to, you know, it's just me. You, you don't want to go ahead and, you know, fly to Louisiana and stay three days because it's not, it's not worth it for anybody. You know, by the time you land, by the time they pick you up, uh, you know, so typically they go for six days and like you know, leave on a, leave on a Monday, come home on a Saturday. That is probably the most typical run. And I've done two of those and that's pretty much what they do. There's a, uh, Krista Hammond, she's uh, out of Minneapolis. Uh, they, strangely enough, they got a Baltimore a number. Uh, she basically does all of the planning for, yes. But in reality, it's more like, I'm not sure how many, how many people are actually in Baltimore. Uh, it seems like they, most of them are out of Minneapolis. Minnesota. And so, uh, but she's very good at getting back to you. Uh, you ask, you know, when do you need, when do you have needs? In fact, I spoke to Dan uh, or texted him, you know, yesterday and asked him because I thought he was supposed to have that meeting with, uh, uh, yeah, he was supposed to have a meeting with United Way on Monday and it was canceled until postponed until tomorrow. So if they get that, if they get that, then they'll be going in and doing the rebuild like we did for Darlene's house. And because there was a lot of drywall work in that, roofing, stuff like that. Um, so are there continuous things happening also? Like, like I mentioned, that you know, yeah. I could find something that needs it. It doesn't necessarily have to do with like the back of the road. Not necessarily. Uh, they, they do go after uh, primarily disasters. Right. Um, and they, also look at areas where a disaster may not have been claimed. In other words, the governor never brought it as a disaster. And they do have a few of those around. Uh, I don't have all of them. Uh, there was one down in Crisfield, Maryland. And um, I actually sent information to the woman down there to see if she needed help. She hasn't gotten back to me. This was about a week ago. Um, and that was kind of unfortunate because I told her, I said, just let us know if it's all, all been taken care of, that's great, or if there's still needs. And I've actually got friends in Annapolis that said, oh, yeah. I mean, when, you know, he was an uh, ex-retired uh, fireman and also taught wood shop, really skilled. And they got people down there that are skilled. Yeah. So, like, uh, when you get deployed, are they like, tell you what kind of gear you need to bring with you or what? What do you need or how many like boots, goggles, gloves, wear jeans, wear Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, it, it's it's jeans. Um, you know, typically you, you want to take a couple pairs of shoes. And, you know, last time I went down to Louisiana, I actually brought boots and never used them. Uh, it wasn't that type of, uh, you know, mucking and uh, gutting. Uh, but I did take a couple pairs of shoes and I took a, you know, as many rowdy jeans as I could, you know, get, and some shorts too, of course. And uh, yeah, and then they they give you shirts, and uh, and, and interesting, you know, but that's the type of thing. I did take a pair of goggles. I did use them, uh, but they do have goggles. They have uh, masks. They have uh, gloves. They have all the PDP type of uh, I said right, all the personal protective. Um, equipment that you need, they, they will provide that for you. Yeah, it's, it, it's the level of networking they've got is, is pretty amazing. I mean, the fact that they're, you know, a week after they're in Ukraine, uh, they, they were down in Louisiana on the 9th of September, and, you know, which was about two weeks after the hurricane down there. They, they get in pretty quick, they really do. And uh, they, they work with a lot of different relief organizations. AmeriCorps is a big one that they'll work here. Uh, they'll pull, pull in kids. Um, 
they'll pull in a bunch of retired folk like me and they'll you know it's and it, and it works and uh, often you know the last trip I went on the kids said they learned so much from me and I'm not sure where that came from but, uh, <laughs> but it was uh, it was uh, it's extremely rewarding uh, work and if you've got that um, time and that's really what it comes down to and uh, when I retired I just prayed to God give me strength uh, you know help me and you know that I can continue doing your work. And so that was the, uh, you know, he sent me to IOCC, which works. Now, there is one thing. Does anybody know the difference between IOCC and OCMC? <laughs> we got one. <laughs> anybody else? Two. Okay. We got yeah, I, I think I know. I think OCMC is for missions. <laughs> yeah. The, um, in, in reality, uh, IOCC is, is not a missionary type of uh, thing. We go in for disaster relief. We help people get their lives back on track uh, through primarily disasters, whether it be they, they were in Lebanon right after that dock explosion. They were there the week after that. They're still there now. And I, I gathered they're actually pulling people out to go to Ukraine. Let me know when, when you've heard enough. Um, but the, um, yeah, talking about Ukraine, that, that is a, uh, there was a, a gentleman, um, Dean, let me see if I can get his last name, Tryon, Tryon, Tryon to feel, Tryon to feel, Dean, his real name is Constantine. He is the CEO in charge of all of IOCC. And um, I was in a meeting over in, uh, on the second, third, and fourth of this month in Chicago. And he got up, you know, he basically flew in just for us and was flying back out as soon as he gave the presentation. I think he was probably on the ground with that for like, like two hours, okay? And he comes in and he's, he's primarily the face of the international program. And of course, the entire time we were up in uh, the training up in Chicago, we were talking about the U.S. programs, and there are a, there's a lot of uh, uh, changes or a lot of improvements they're making uh, with the U.S. program. But he came in to kind of round that out and give us an idea, and, and talk about the fact that they're in Africa, they're in Europe, they're in the Middle East, and he talked about all the countries around. And but he wasn't talking about Ukraine. And then at the end, he basically says. You know, he pauses and you know, he's a big guy. I mean, you know, he's basically, you know, about the size of Gene, uh, but he's got all dark hair, you know, dark beard. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm no different. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he, he's, a, he's a big guy and he, um, he wasn't showing any presentation. He was just walking back and forth, you know, pacing. You could tell he had heightened anxiety. And he gets and he says, now I'm going to talk about you. And he sat there and he said, all my 26 years at ISCC, he says, all of the time I've been preparing for this one single moment. And he, and he told us, he said, then he said, we're going, we've already contacted the patriarchy in Poland and Romania and Moldova. And he says, we're already, you know, putting people on the ground there now. And this was the 4th of, of March. And they already had people, and he, that, that, that time he says they were pulling people out of Lebanon to go into Romania. And it was pretty, pretty impressive. Because, um, you know, he's, he was saying more than I'm saying right now about the networking that they do and the way they pull people together. And, you know, ISCC is actually, you know, they're, they're doing some wonderful things out there. And um, I'm just glad to be part of it. Any other questions? Thank you.